Good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you have joined us today for Classroom 2.0 Live. I'm Kim Case, and I am so pleased to co-host with Peggy George and Lorna Costantini. And today we're going to be talking about open online university courses with a very special guest, Alec Kuros. Each week at the same time, we gather to discuss ways to use and engage students using technology. Our broadcast consists of a one-hour session that is recorded. The link to the full video, audio recording, and chat log are posted on our Classroom 2.0 Live site at live.classroom20.com. And we're not going to be doing our usual intro to Illuminate since we have the fabulous video created by Lorna posted before the show. So right now what I'd like to do is have everybody indicate where they're coming from this morning. So if you can click on the laser pointer, which is the blue wand with the red starburst, and then indicate your location on the world map, we would greatly appreciate that so we can see where everybody is from and where they're joining us uh, to participate today. Yes, and I'm hearing lots of snow um, on the news and reports here during our session. And it's so great to see locations throughout the United States, way up in Canada, over in Europe, Asia. And it's great that you have taken your Saturday, especially this Saturday, which is the last Saturday right before Christmas, and taken your time. Hopefully you can get some shopping in after the session. So we're going to go ahead now and move on to some of the poll questions that we have today. And we'll be using the green check and the red X, which are right next, uh, near the door, just below the participant window. And our first polling question is, have you ever participated in an open online university course. If you've participated in one or in Alex's courses, please click the green check. And if you haven't experienced this yet, click the red X right next to the blue door. I'll give everybody a few more seconds to vote. Green check if you have. Red X if you have not. And let me get those results. And it looks like about 30% of the group has not, and about 42% have. So it's a fairly close margin. So um, it will be interesting, and I think you're going to really um, enjoy this topic. And let's go on to poll question number two. Let me clear the results. And have you ever participated in any of Alex's online online courses. Alex does a great job with his courses. And if you've participated in any of Alex's courses, please click the green check. And if you have not, the red X. Let me get the result. And about 50% have not, and about 22% have. And I'm sure after today's session that and uh, your next course, Alex, that percentage will change. And let's go into our final question is would you be interested whoops, let me clear it first. Okay. Would you be interested in having more universities offer open courses? If you would be interested, click the green check. And if not, click the red X. And this will probably be an overwhelming majority. And I know that um, at one time they have posed or they're working on an open uh, university, completely open and free around the world. And it looks like an overwhelming 69% would be interested in having um, more open online university courses available. And I, t I can totally concur with that. 
So I'm going to go ahead now and pass it over to Lorna or Peggy, and they will introduce Alec and our newbie question. So take it away, Lorna. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, everyone in the chat room, I can't believe how honored I am to be able to introduce our guest today. Uh, Dr. Ellis Curris is a professional, excuse me, a professor of educational technology and media, and the coordinator of information and communication technology at the Faculty of Education, the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. Uh, Alex also serves as the assistant director of Saskatchewan Instructional Development and Research Unit. He's a scholar and advocate of openness in distributed environments. He's given hundreds of workshops and presentations, and there's links in our GLAM links to those workshops. He's known nationally and internationally for his work. He talks about openness in education, social learning, instructional design, digital citizenship, and critical media. Uh, literacy. I'm having trouble talking, and then my dog's joining me. Well, Alex, this is just the beginning of uh, a formal uh, introduction. I want to drop in a couple of thoughts here. And one of them is the first time I ever came across Alex was a couple years ago when I found him using something called CamTwist and Ustream. And at that time, it was really innovative. And the post that he put into his blog about how to use these particular tools has resonated all across the internet because it's been a fantastic reference point for a lot of us using um, online media. And the other thing I think we need to uh, work on is that uh, congratulating Alex on his uh, uh, runner-up in the EduBlog Awards for the Twitter, uh, the best Twitter. And, uh, Alex, we follow you faithfully and read all your Twitters, so we're very happy that you've been able to bring that knowledge to us today at Classroom 2.0. And I would like to turn it over to Alex, and if you would like to add to my uh, description, please feel free to do that. We're going to ask you to start with the newbie question of the day, and what is an open question, excuse me, what is an open online course, and why does it matter? Over to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Lorna. As I said in the chat room, you said my name correctly and the province correctly, which is sometimes difficult to do. So that's all that matters in that. So thanks so much. Uh, that's a very humbling introduction. And thank you, Kim and Peggy, for having me here today. Um, I wanted to talk about that question quickly first. I think that's a really important question. Um, open online education really means different things. Um, there are some open educational resources or open courseware projects, you may have heard those terms, that are focused on the idea of open content, which is really uh, quite something if you, if you look at Dave Wiley's stuff around open content. Uh, the idea is the, con the content from universities is shared freely under usually a Creative Commons license. And if you don't know what a Creative Commons license is, please check that out at creat creativecommons.org. Uh, this means that usually the good content can be consumed, remixed, reused in many different ways. And so that's a really big deal when you think about university content being free and available. Um, I'd like to extend that vision a little bit, and this is sort of what I've been doing with my ECNI 831 grad course and some of my undergraduate courses. Uh, my vision of open online education is that the live instruction is also available, that participants can take courses as credit or non-credit, and the only thing that you really pay for, if that's your option, is the assessment that leads to a credit. So the learning is free. The only piece that sort of is missing from this scenario is whether you want credit for that or not. And sometimes I find that the students that are taking my courses online and for free are the ones benefiting the most. And that's a really kind of a neat thing. So to me, the non-credit students actually add value to the process rather than become detractors. So in an ideal situation, everyone gets the learning, some people get the credit, but everyone contributes to create a rich learning environment together. And that's kind of a neat thing. So why does this matter? Um, for me, I think that we are naturally moving to this place where informal learning is becoming increasingly important. Uh, added to that, I think that formalized educational institutions will lose their monopoly over controlling learning as we see it in society. So I think that our, our formal institutions as having the monopoly of uh, over controlling learning is something to change. And if you want to learn more about sort of how this is happening, I'm going to point you to uh, Dave Wiley's Penn State address. Um, it's, it's terrific. He talks about what universities 
give us. And if you think, what are the important things that we get from a university? Uh, Wiley talks about content, support, the social life that students get, and the degrees. And he feels like really the only one that's left that's sort of valid is the idea of degrees. And that's something that's disaggregating in some ways. So I would, you know, you could probably, you know, spend the next 20 minutes watching that, but I'd love to keep you here. So <laughs> please try to think about that after, because it's a really engaging presentation, and Wiley is terrific in that. So hopefully that helps to uh, to sort of answer that particular question. And I'm going to get in, into my bit of my presentation here. So thanks for sticking with me on this. So. What I really want, rather than open content, I like the idea of open educational experiences. Um, but I think before we can actually get into that, I think you have to understand what open scholarship is. So what I'm leading to here is I'm going to give you a, an example of what we actually did in ECNI 831, but I want to kind of give you the making of what it takes to become uh, an instructor of a course that's an open course. Because I think it's much more a mindset rather than a skill set to actually get to that place. So first of all, I'll start off with me, who I am. Um, I'm an instructor. Uh, I'm a family person. I, I do quite a few workshops, and I try to inspire people to take risks. I have a podcast that I will do once in a while and a blog that I do once in a while. You'll see me on Twitter quite often. Um, but most of the, I, I think I got a really nice comment yesterday that uh, someone mentioned that, you know, I really like Alex's tweets. Even the personal ones are really good. And that's me. I put out the stuff that I do. At the same time, I put the stuff that is personal to me. But that makes up all of me. And that's really important to me as an open educator. Um, I'm from Saskatchewan. If you don't know where that is, that's basically where it is, way up there. It's rather cold today. Um, but it's been much colder in the last few days. There are my children, you know, digging out through the snow. There's my two-year-old. He's really good. I've found that it's much easier than me actually digging through the snow. And this was Halloween, and uh, this was rain. She wanted to be a kangaroo, so it's probably one of the first snow kangaroos you may have seen. This is a Flickr group um, that uh, uh, that was created for me. Um, and, and this is actually, if you can fly like Alec Koros. And, uh, it, I thought this was kind of interesting because I, I created that um, ju me jumping off the couch picture that you saw a couple of uh, slides ago. And then there was actually a group that was created. I thought this was kind of cool. And to me, this is the idea. No, it wasn't. Uh, I'm to, I totally forget the name now. I don't know why. Um, I should know that. From Oregon, uh, principal, I just can't remember the name right now, who actually created that group. Sorry about that. It's in there. Tim Lauer. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, I should remember that now. Um, some of you may know me from the 2009 365 project, which I think is really cool. If you've been part of this, this is another way for people to build social capital and show both their professional lives and their personal lives. And this is just simply taking one photograph a day. This is uh, something I learned from Darcy Norman. And I've been part of this in the last little while. It's been absolutely fantastic. And for me, it keeps a really rich record of photographs for my children in the future. And I just think it's just terrific. So I've been doing this for about almost two years now. Uh, I have you know, rich record, at least one photograph of a day from someone. And this is all part of me as an individual opening out. And when I get into things like YouTube, I've got uh, presentations I've got there, but I've also got photo um, videos of personal things. I don't put the most personal things, but I put personal things up there. Um, I share my music, which gives me a personal a part of me that people can connect to or ignore. Um, I have my blog, which, you, which I haven't posted to a whole lot lately, but I will post mostly academic things there and resources to share and so on. But I also post things uh, that are also more personal, but probably less personal. Of course, I put all of my presentations as this one will be up online uh, in SlideShare. And you'll notice that I'm sort of moving to the places that my personal kind of bleeds into the professional and probably the most professional. I noticed that it was someone who had shared it in the chat room. If you go to coros.ca slash CV, I'm just up for tenure and promotion at my university, so I decided to put this whole thing online. Uh, that's me. That's, this is the first time it's been done at my university. But it's the whole idea that I live my life in the open. I also want to teach in the open. And this is me sort of opening up as an open educator. And I think these things are important 
Uh, I'm not saying you have to put your entire life or all of the photographs of your kids online. That's, that's a very personal thing. But there's a mindset around actually becoming more connected to the world and connected to colleagues across the world that really does help you become an open educator. And I'm kind of you know, give you an actual you know, academic uh, quote here. Uh, Web 2.0 tools that might allow academics to reflect and reimagine what they do with scholars. Such tools might positively, positively affect, even transform research, teaching, and service responsibilities. Only if scholars choose to build serious academic lives online, presenting semi-public selves and becoming invested in and connected to the work of their peers and students. And I think this is a really important quote to think about uh, because I think as we, as we become professionals that there are pieces of us that we may want to share online. Personal learning networks is a term that you've probably seen a lot on Twitter if you are on Twitter. Uh, PLN is the short form. You may have also heard the term personal learning environment, which is fairly uh, closely linked to that. And I go back to this photograph of my parents back in 1957 when they first came to Canada. This is actually my dad on a boat, uh, Halifax Harbor, Pier 21. And this was networks back in the day. No technology, but there were still networks. Social networks didn't just you know, emerge when MySpace and Friendster emerged. They've been around for a long, long time. But we have the tools now to tag things. Now, if this was my dad in Facebook, and if Facebook existed in 1957, you could tag this. And I could follow this story through, and I could find out you know, Mar uh, Mario Coros' family, and I can see who he's linked to. And you can actually make these social networks, uh, these connections much more explicit. You've seen this. This is Obama in Berlin. Uh, now everyone has the technology, but they may not necessarily be connected. So you see all of these people personalizing their experience in these ways. Um, everyone has a camera. One person even has a laptop, which I think is, you know, you bring sort of a laptop to an event like this, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I think it's kind of interesting that everyone wants to personalize their experience. That's, it's not, you know, obviously this is going to be in the news and so on, but this particular photograph and all those photographs taken um, probably a bit are, are a bit isolated, but in a sense this is a network without connections yet. But then we look at a place like Twitter, for instance, where we actually see school divisions and schools and teachers and administrators uh, freely talk to each other online no matter what school they're in. They go beyond the boundaries of school and so on. And so the first um, video I want to you know, pass along here, I'm going to give a web tour for a second. Um, so a, a window is going to pop up <coughs> in your browser and it's uh, Twitter in 60 Seconds by Jim Gates. And if you haven't seen it, here it is. All right, so I think that's worked for me, and it's over at this point. This was, that was created by Jim Gates. He's in Pennsylvania. Uh, I think he's a retired school administrator. He created that for Dean Cheresky, one of my colleagues here in Saskatchewan. Um, and, and it's really a really good idea to think about. First of all, I kind of showed you a, a story of three crowds there. One, a social networks without the tools. The second was networks with, or, or, or tools without the social network. And now the third one, this, this particular one, is when people have social networks and they also have the tools and they're using it to connect. And I think it's really kind of neat to think about that. So we're going to move kind of to the next piece here. Um, and you may have seen this before, but this is sort of what I see. This came out of my dissertation in, in 2006. The idea that that was our typical teacher network. 
um, we were linked, you know, and some people, your colleagues may be linked very much like this. If you're here, there's a good chance that you've stepped out of these boundaries already, that your, your network is quite a bit different. And I know that some of you are actually here in the room. I noticed a couple um, that are in this room. This is, to me, the, the network teacher. Um, this is many tools, but the most important thing is how you, who you're connecting to with these particular tools. And this was, the, the photographs I've taken here were actually just people that I connected with to over a two-day period. And I think that was kind of neat that I just basically, you know, who are the people I'm talking to within two days? And I took all of those different photographs and I stuck them in, a, in this piece. And I was thinking that there were maybe only two or three people that were actually um, people who were at my university. And I was thinking, I'm talking to a lot of people that are not really affiliated to me, but they are, I'm reading from them, I'm talking to them, I'm connecting to them on Twitter and so on, and I think that's just amazing. See if I can draw on this. For instance, this is, this is Sarah Hill. She was one of my Ecom 455 students. And it's kind of interesting because I also taught this guy the same semester, Stephen King, who actually taught Sarah back when she was in grade school. Over here is my grade 8 teacher. He's in my PLN today, and I learn with him continually. And it's kind of interesting to think of it, to think that these people become all part of uh, my networks, no matter what, you know, whether I'm supposed to be teaching them officially or whether they've taught each other in formalized ways. We all become sort of this ambient uh, personal learning network, and I think that's really, really cool to think about. So. And then about deep, deep communities, I want to leave that to you because a lot of people who criticize things like Twitter and, and PLNs and so on don't think about really the deep communities that can be built. And I really like this quote, network proximity, so think about that, that term, network proximity, facilitates new kinds of spatially unbound communities. And that these emerging forms of sociality are equally or more meaningful than the older ones. Community is thus liberated, unhinged from space, it can be maintained regardless of distance. And I think that's kind of a neat one to think about. Um, the Kuros monk, yeah, I, want, I should be watching the chat here. <laughs> that's, that's not a bad idea at all. Um, anyway, so I, but I think that when, when you start to look at um, the idea of the personal learning network and how that fits with the communities that you have, because I don't, I've, I've often had this chat with colleagues that I work with, you know, but are these real communities? Are these deep communities? And I would say the people that I connect with on a daily basis, absolutely, much deeper sometimes than the, you know, the trivial connections that I sometimes, uh, you know, with the, the person next door and so on. Just be, you know, we don't have to be friends just because we live beside each other. And I think it's, it's, it's something that we have to really explore. What are deep communities? The big other thing here that's happening, and this sort of alluded to this, the whole idea of uh, a free, of open content, Dave Wiley stuff. Uh, Dave Wiley was actually the person who coined the term um, open content. Um, if you even look be beyond Dave Wiley, especially if you look at Richard Stallman, you will get the whole idea of, of, of free software and free knowledge and that sort of thing. And I'm going to show you another video here. This one is the Palm Now Network. You may have seen this ad. And I'll open it up in a window here. Oh, that didn't work very good. Sorry, I'll fix it for you. There we go. All right, so that was done for me. I hope it went through uh, to you. 
And obviously, Sprint and AT and T and all of the other phone companies, uh, Rogers here in Canada and Fastel in my province, uh, have a lot to gain by you using a lot more of the, these connections. But I think these particular commercials really show that we are moving towards this particular piece. And I think it's it's kind of interesting to see how connected we really are. And there's this whole world of people who are connected in these ways that are somewhat remote and and disconnected from people who are not or, or the other way around. And I think that's really important to understand that those who are connected become connected but sometimes become disconnected from those who are disconnected in some ways. Or, they, or, or people who are disconnected just don't understand it. Um, but knowledge and computing, this is a subtle shift that's really happened. And I, and I know if you think about what you used to do with computers even 10 years ago or 20 years ago in your own, uh, you know, I, I went through sort of the Mavis Beacon typing stage and the math muncher and those sort of things. And those are really kind of cool things back in the day. Um, if we look at sort of where we are going in society, and this has several layers here. So the whole idea of individual growth versus group growth, we're kind of moving towards that. We take our big terms around learning, objectivism, cognitivism, constructivism, and social learning, which is certainly coming to the, you know, social learning has always been there, but only now do we have the tools in the advanced pedagogy to really look towards social learning. And the whole idea that technology at the same point, if you notice that any of the applications that you have, uh, available today, almost everything has a sharing feature. Share this with someone else. Uh, most of the websites you go to, you can share on Facebook, on Twitter, or whatever else. And I think that's really important to understand that most of the things that we are, most of the media and most of the tools that we use today have some sor sort of social sharing feature. And this is not because the technology is driving it, but it's also because some of the bottom points in the blue these changes or shifts in society are changing this as well. So I think that's important to understand that it's happening at the same time in some ways simultaneously, but also one driving the other, whether you want to talk about technology determinism or instrumentalism, those are kind of related topics to this. Now I often talk about the control of knowledge. And open content and open courses are really a reaction to something becoming too tightly controlled. And if you look at these uh, particular examples, these are all examples where people have differing uh, views about what knowledge is and how knowledge should be controlled. So I'll see if I can uh, take my pencil around here. Uh, some of you know Nine Inch Nails and Radiohead, fairly liberal ways of you know, sharing their music, uh, giving away their music or, or in, in various formats. Nine Inch Nails put all their music in garage band format so people could remix it. Uh, Radiohead put their music in, uh, in the form that uh, you could actually buy, pay what you wanted to, uh, you know, zero or ten dollars or whatever else, but you get value added by buying it. Metallica didn't like this very much. They're the ones who kind of got rid of Napster at the time. Walt Disney really loved to uh, take things from the, the public domain, like our rich stories and fairy tales, but he didn't want to uh, l let them go once he did have a hold of them. Donald Trump over here wanted the trademark that you're fired, uh, uh, that, that particular word or uh, phrase. Uh, Michael Geis is kind of a Canadian hero who's been blocking things like, uh, or helping to block things like uh, net neutrality or, 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 or he's for net neutrality for instance or blocking a legislation against it. You must know about the Pirate Bay. Um, you know, if you look at all the, oh, here's Richard Stallman down here. If you don't know Richard Stallman, you should. Uh, Larry Lessig, founder of the Creative Commons. Um, a couple of kind of genuine heroes down here. Here's Percy Schmeiser from my province who fought Monsanto around grain, um, around actually owning grain. So this is becoming, you know, this guy actually ended up losing, unfortunately. Monsanto gained in that case. Another hero I would say in some cases is Jamie uh, Rossette Thomas who was sued for about $1.2 million, uh, approximately $80,000 per slide or per song that she downloaded or her children downloaded. Anyway, all different ways of looking at knowledge and this is something quite important. Um, so when we look at this and how it changes in education, you see the rise of a lot of different types of knowledge. So MIT OpenCourseWare was one of the big things around uh, sharing all of your resources. It's probably not the best. There are many of them. And it wasn't the first, but it's probably the biggest one because it's got the most money. You can get Stanford lectures on iTunes. Uh, you can get 
open access journals or from the directory of open access journals and so on. Many of these places available now have all of this stuff online, like have all of this content online and it's rich, it's available and so on. And this is a big change from the, the, the lockdown copyright stuff that we used to have. And of course, at the same time, all of the tools that we have, whether it's YouTube or Ning or Facebook, become distributive mechanisms for these tools, for this content in a lot of ways. So not only do we have free tools, we also have free content. And this becomes a really cool thing when you're an open educator. And then there's the whole um, thing that uh, it's sort of a belief system that I have. I believe that humankind is mostly good. And I think if we kind of buy in or give in to belief systems that, that often our schools talk about that we are mostly evil and that there are cyber predators and there are people around every corner that are willing to hurt us and so on, which does happen on a daily basis, uh, but it's not the majority. I believe that we are mostly good and that for these things to happen and for us to really let go of some of our fears around open education, we have to really believe this. And here's some examples. Um, you know, this is a kind of a, if you look at YouTube, YouTube content isn't bad. This is Lev Grossman talking about uh, some of the comments on YouTube make you weep for the future of humanity just for the spelling alone, never mind the obscenity and naked, naked hatred, which I think is a great uh, quote I first heard in Wesh, Michael Wesh's lecture. Um, YouTube comments, if you look at those stuff and if you focus on it, you're not going to get a good feeling about wanting to use you, YouTube in the classroom. But once you get past that with your students and once you start to look at the great content available here, and I think kids become somewhat oblivious to it, and I don't think they buy into being like that. Um, I think it's a good example of uh, where, where humanity, kind, you know, or a few people kind of change it for everyone. Um, then the media controls us in some ways as well. Everyone will remember where they were on the day that all of America stopped working and watched an empty balloon. I love this. Um, so I, so I think this is kind of interesting to think about. So, so uh, the media will control what we watch in some ways. And sometimes it's our appetite and sometimes the media drives our appetite. But when you start to look at some really good presentations on the web about the web and how it's built and some of the really good stories out there, uh, a TED talk I'd recommend is Jonathan Zittrain and he talks about um, how the web is actually built and ha actually hosts many ways that we can actually be randomly kind to each other. And he talks about the technical infrastructure of the web. He gives some stories around how Wikipedia's content and form is actually quite moral. And he talks about the idea of hitchhiking. He talks, he basically asks the, the audience, you know, who, when have you hitchhiked lately? Um, you know, who hitchhikes anymore? And most people say that they, ha they don't hitchhike anymore. But in some ways, in sort of digital ways, we're hitchhiking in some ways. And he actually brings up the notion, uh, if you've ever heard of couch surfing, do I have that in here? Oh yeah, it's the, the very top one. Couch surfing is basically a website that allows you to kind of, uh, uh, to not rent, but basically sleep on someone's couch when you're traveling. So basically, you say, I'm, I'm visiting such or such city um, and I'd like to have a place to stay because you don't want to stay in a hotel because you don't have the money, for instance, and so you do couch surfing. And if you look at that, there's kind of rating systems, people who have had experience or histories of doing this and not obviously harming people, uh, but it's a really big thing. And I know a lot of my undergrads who do this couch surfing thing that go across, across the world, don't worry about hotels. They not only get to stay for uh, free at places, but they also, um, they also get to learn about the culture with people who actually live in the culture, which I think is really, really cool. So anyway, that's kind of a neat thing to look at. If you don't know about Kiva and you haven't bought things for Christmas, check out Kiva. It's, a, it's really a wonderful thing, kiva.org. If you learn anything from this presentation today, just go to Kiva and give someone a gift certificate of Kiva today. Check it out. Um, other things I'm not going to go into because I don't have time, but there's a lot of really good things online. Um, Michael Wesh also talks about this, and although you know, there's McLuhan talks about we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. So, which is a technological determinist type um, uh, tenet, really. Um, but I think there are some really good things around that. One of the things he really brings up in this particular talk, if you haven't watched, the machine is changing us. You should. Uh, 
he talks about YouTube and other social media mitigate connection without constraint. In some cases, this actually leads to tremendously deep communities. And he gives good examples of that. Uh, he, he brings up two mediated culture heroes. He talks about the free hug movement, which I think is kind of neat, although it's a bit isolated. Uh, this is happening. I've seen it around, uh, around uh, my area geographically, uh, all over the Internet, obviously. Uh, if you haven't seen free hugs, you should also do that. And he also talks about this other guy called Mad V, who's this anonymous YouTube person who does little videos like basically he gets everyone to write something really important on their hand and he aggregates that and so on, which really kind of gives you a cool sense of love and trust and understanding. And, and although you may be able to kind of deconstruct these things apart, it does show that there are these beautiful lights of humanity uh, within the web like that. And I think it's more prevalent than we sometimes think. This is one that I just saw a couple weeks ago, or maybe a week ago. This was a red. Uh, I, I used the, the uh, social media streaming site called um, Reddit, and this was on the front page the other day. And basically, this was a request from a guy who says, "Can you help me pay, uh, fix my last picture of my mom?" So he says, "My mother died of cancer yesterday. This is the last picture of us together." Uh, and I wondered if anyone with mad Photoshop skills should touch up the picture. Okay, so he puts it out there. This became a really huge and long thread. This is the original photo. This is why he wanted to fix up because she had the ventilator tubes, uh, you know, up to her mouth. And it's a really nice picture. And I think this is really cool. So if you look at there, there are tons of people helping and doing the Photoshopping. And you know, it's not a really easy thing. You know, with people who have better Photoshopping skills, I'm sure it probably would be okay. But really, it does take some time. So this is one of the results. You know, so you go from this to that. Oh, sorry, to this. And I think that's just absolutely amazing that people are giving up their time to do this. And the content and the conversation throughout was really rich and deep. And this is the type of things that you should be focusing on uh, if, you're, if you're talking about open education, if you're talking about uh, learning on the web, connecting to human beings. This is kind of a, a really good thing to, to start looking at. So that kind of goes towards open teaching. And I think this is really uh, oh, actually, I should, I should mention, I just saw one this morning on Reddit, um, or it might have been yesterday, that another guy who's talking about his, uh, his mother just got fired from her school board. She's a teacher, but she couldn't pay for health care and for union dues at the same time. So this year, for the first time in 22 years, she didn't pay for union dues, and, uh, and, they, and she got fired. Now she can't afford a lawyer. So all these people were putting in thousands of dollars to actually allow um, you know, this person to get some legal representation. Yeah, it was over, over $3,000. Uh, I think the last one I saw was $3,500. And just a really neat thing. And sure, there's a lot of distrust that we can, we can gain from those things. And we may have, you know, some, you may know people who have been duped on the Internet, but there is a lot of genuine caring going on. And I think that's really important. So back to open teaching. So this, the, all of this stuff before was sort of the lead up to this because I don't think you could become an open educator unless you understand knowledge that it is changing, unless you understand that part of you has to be into this as an open educator, that you have to create sort of a personal profile because I ask a lot of things from people all across the Internet. Um, people I sometimes know fairly well and sometimes I don't know very well. And they give a lot from, to me, to the course and so on. And I think that's really important. Um, so these are really important things. And the idea of developing a personal learning network is incredibly important before you become an open educator. So once I've sort of established this, I've, I put up a couple courses. Probably the most prominent one was this ECNI 831. Uh, the, the, actual call, uh, the actual name of the course is called Social Media and Open Education. Uh, so we are learning about social media and open education while being immersed in it. So one of the things I did to kind of get you know, people sort of excited about this, I actually created a grad trailer. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, I will put it up here so you can watch it.
All right, so that was my course trailer. So hopefully you got a chance to see that. Um, that whole idea that uh, even if you put those sort of things out, I, I was trying to push for the non-traditional way of opening a course to other people to get people interested, and it seemed to have worked the first time through. And so you do things like that. I noticed a lot of trailers around conferences and so on at the time, and I thought that was kind of a nifty way of doing things. I also uh, put out a call for non-credit students, and so I created a on my ECNI 831. I'll actually show you the uh, ACI 831.wikispaces.com. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I'll actually show you the, or I'll bring this up in the, uh, and I'll put it down here as well. So right, if you see the web tour here. I'll give you a sense of what this actually looked like. So hopefully you can see this. And I actually have on the sidebar on the right hand side where it says non-credit students. So if I go to non-credit students, people can go to this simple Google form. And I'm not, it actually doesn't seem like it's uploading here. I'm not sure why. Oh, there it goes. Um, so people can fill out that Google spreadsheet. And then what was kind of neat, I realized after the fact, um, I was able to take all of the people from around the world who signed up as non-credit students um, and then uh, put it into something called Mapalist. Uh, let's see if I can find I can't remember if it's Mapalist.com. Mapalist.com, I'll try that. Yep. So it's Mapalist. And basically you could actually uh, take your Google spreadsheet which has the name field in it or the geographic field in it and automatically creates a map um, that puts all the people across the map, and which is or a map like this. So I was able to see here. Now I can't move this around, but you can see people from around the world. If you click on them on the actual map list link, which I think is in that uh, ECI A31 place, you can actually see where they're from and who they are, and so on. So I thought that was really cool to get a sense of who who was actually in our course. Um, I also thought it was really important that. Um, John Mott talks about this, and so does Dave Wiley. The whole idea that if you take a course management system and you have students participate in a course management system, like Moodle or WebCT or Blackboard, that um, what happens is all of their stuff is there, and every four months you just delete everything. All those conversations and the communities that you've developed, you developed in that four-month time, it just disappears. Um, so I think that's really important. And the whole idea that if you did this to Facebook, what if we made people in Facebook uh, delete their content every four months? You know, it doesn't make sense in any way. So what I got students to do was create their own blog sites. Every student had their own blog, and they, all of them had uh, a place where they can continue the conversation. So if they decided to continue learning beyond the course, that was under their control. And for me, all I had to do was take all of their um, uh, all of their uh, content and uh, basically aggregate it through a reader, and I was able to barely quickly share it in uh, Google Reader. Um, give you another example of sort of a real-time search. I'll see if I can find that right now. Uh, let's see. So if I go to something like Spezify, let's see, http colon spezify dot com. So students got really good at searching for stuff that was also real-time. So is this going to work? I don't know if you've seen Spezify, but this is kind of a, a cool real-time search term. So if I type in ECI A31, because that was our course tag. Oh, it doesn't let me do that on here. But if you take it and you type in like ECI A31, if you look at it in Spezify, you can actually see visually a lot of the stuff happening at the same time. So it was kind of cool to, to use visual or real time search. There are a number of other ones. Or Google search is becoming uh, a much more visual search oriented type tool. As you notice, they're bringing in some new features. Um, we also did extension where we actually have our students be mentors in one of our undergraduate courses. So these are, if you look in the background, these are some of the classrooms we connected to. So our students also become, uh, because we're, we're allowing people to become part of our class, so we wanted to do it the other way around, where we become part of their classes. In a sense, we become to, uh, I don't know, missionaries of open source, maybe that's not the, the best thing, or of open education, but we try to also get people to think about opening in both ways, and I think that's really, really important. 
Um, and I really want to establish the idea of the culture of sharing. And that was something that was really important for our classes. We actually had Dean Shresky come in and talk about uh, sharing as, as from, a, from a perspective of a school administrator, uh, school consultant type of thing. And I thought that was a really good session. And we continue to kind of push that whole culture of sharing as being sort of the default rather than something you do, well, maybe I'll share my things. But it's really, really important. Um, the whole idea of invisible colleges I think is incredibly important. That I don't have to worry uh, just about the colleagues that live in my building, but I can also get people that I believe are in my invisible college to become an, be part of the course and actually do sessions. So I bring in tons of good people from around the world, just like web, you know, Classroom Live uh, 2.0 Live does. But I do that within the course environment, that you get people from different institutions and they become part of the course. And the whole idea of PD gone wild that you can participate in things like you're participating in now. That every time you wake up in the morning and you turn on your Twitter, that there's a good chance that there is something going on around the world that you can participate. And it's just amazing. Anytime you want PD, it's there. It's ambient. Um, but when we think about it in schools, it's only like you know 3:30 on the, the third Thursday in May or whatever it is, and it just doesn't make much sense anymore. So I think it's important to open up to those options. Um, Real-time collaboration that we have tools out there that can become real-time collaboration um, that you know that we can just turn on and dispose in some ways. And we also develop the idea of trusted groups because. Obviously, there are people out there that we don't want to communicate with or collaborate with uh, for whatever reason. The majority will be people that we want to. And the educators that we connect with on Twitter have been very, very good. We haven't had any problems in three years of you know, people running into sort of shady characters or that sort of thing. But it's also important to start to think about taking the tools and building your trusted groups, whether it's through a Ning, whether it's through a listing service like one of these here. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to actually to develop your groups of trusted groups. And I think it's really important that we start to think about new roles as educators. Um, I really uh, focus on media literacy, on social networks, and the changing shape of knowledge. And I see myself as a network Sherpa that doesn't really spew out content myself, but I'm a connector. I allow people to connect to others. And I help people establish and, and, uh, and kind of run the train. I guide them through the train in a lot of ways. And if they run into problems, uh, I help them. But if they run into problems that I can't help them with, I connect them to someone who can in some ways. And I really like this quote from uh, Will Richardson which really kind of uh, emphasizes the last point. We as educators need to reconsider our roles in students' lives to think of ourselves as connectors first and content experts second. And then I've also really worked on the idea of thinning walls um, because I don't think it's easy for anyone to jump into an open course and just become, uh, you know, go from private to public. There's a really long transition that allows people, you, you kind of the idea of taking people's fears uh, you know, letting them understand the research that's out there that, uh, and, and the tools out there and finding mentors and so on that they can slowly open up to the world of possibilities that's in the open space. And I think that's really important, but it does take some time and I don't think you ever leave it. Um, and through this, I think it's really important that people establish the idea of professional identities. And that's one thing I really focus on in my undergraduate courses is the idea that people can develop these professional identities and they live beyond the course. They don't just end at the time the course ends. These continue on. And part of the thing that you do in university education is allow people to have positive professional identities rather than focus all the bad things on all the bad things that you could possibly do in your Facebook or on your Twitter or so on. So people who have taken the course you know, tend to really like it. It's, it's really kind of neat to see that people who took the course three years ago still participate in sessions. And I think that's just fantastic. I mean, what better compliment do you have as an instructor or to a model of education when people keep coming back to take the same things maybe differently but continue to open those doors for those people? And those people become mentors. Those people become advocates of this type of learning and they become very powerful um, people to, uh, to come back and share, you know, share the sessions, to share their expertise and also share it within their own school districts. So some comments from students, I was able to go out and learn through 
throughout the entire week, the entire year, and I'm still learning with everyone. Um, this the second one is from uh, Cindy Seibel, who I think knows uh, Lorna Constantini quite well. Um, the best part of the course is that it's not ending with the connections we've built. It never has to end. And I like this. Uh, this is from a school administrator from over 20 years or 25 years in the school district. The course has been the most profound PD experience I've ever had. It forced me to critique and review my practice. I never knew how important social networks were. Now I couldn't be a teacher without being connected. It's drastically changed my view of education. And when you see these sort of really strong feelings toward the experience, you feel that you've been successful in some way. I'm going to show you this, and, and this is something I just saw yesterday. I don't know if you've seen this before, so, so, so stare closely at this photograph. Look at Goldeneye. Look at Pierce Brosnan for a second. Got it? I mean, are you all there? All right. Now look at that photograph and look back at Pierce. Do you see something different? I'm hoping this works for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and that's what I think is really, really important to some of the people who have experienced the course. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. Once you see the power of open education, you can't unsee it. And people become very powerful. Uh, you know, it's a very powerful idea. And so I think that's something that's quite important, and I think that's something that, uh, that continues to emanate through the, through the course experience. And I think some of you have probably gotten there uh, through your informal learning experiences for being here today and so on. And I think maybe you can, this resonates to you in some ways. So the last slide is just basically a connector slide. Uh, if you want to connect with me, uh, I, I see about 79 people in this room that I'd love to connect with to with the, in, in the future. We'd love to see you the next time the course is offered. It's uh, in fall 2010, which is a ways away, but uh, it's probably a good thing because we'll have much more exciting things to happen in the future. So if there's anything else you want to uh, talk to me about in the meantime, the next eight months or so on, uh, other than that, have a happy holiday and thanks for joining me today. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Alec. And um, I pulled one question from the, the chat that you hadn't addressed, or I don't think you addressed, was how do you balance university constructs like course load and teaching heavy institutions regarding things like generating FTE? And I'm not certain what FTE means. Mean, so. Okay, I, I think I, I cut the per first part of that. Um, we're actually very lucky at my institution where we have, um, when, when I do an online course, it actually ca counts for 1.5. So say if my load was 3, I could only do, I, I could only actually do 2 courses um, because it actually counts for more. So our institution is actually moving to the place where we understand that doing a course like this counts for more. Now 1.5 is an arbitrary measure in some ways, but What's also kind of nice about the way I do these courses is I spend the time working with students to connect them to people, connect them to ideas, connect them to answers, connect them to, math, uh, to mentors, rather than having to, okay, I'm going to learn this today, then I'm going to teach it to my students so I can learn it even better. It's not about me and it's not about the content. I would rather spend more time uh, you know, having fun, learning, doing the things I do every single day, making the connections, and then saying to someone who knows something really good about, you know, cell phones, like Lisa from from our Liz from last week, for instance. Maybe I could say, Liz, we want to learn more about cell phones. Can you come in and, and spend some time with us? And I bet you there's a good chance she'd say yes. You know, there's other people here. Lisa was the last one here. Uh, for instance, yeah, I was probably thinking of Lisa. Lisa's come into our class several times to talk about you know, the stuff she knows. I don't know the stuff she knows from her rich experience with Google and so on. And it's really, really kind of neat to think that we can actually uh, connect to people that way. And we give back whenever we can. And I, I will be repaying Lisa eventually uh, down, down the road. But I think it's important that it doesn't add more. It changes things so that the things that you used to do you don't do anymore. The things that you do now are more powerful. And I think that's really important. And many have asked when your uh, next course is. I know you said in fall 2010. 
Yeah, it's fall 2010, so starting September, and there will be a lot of you probably from my Twitter stream and so on to get more people to uh, to know about it and so on. So I'd love for anyone in this room to be part of it. Uh, you're you're certainly, certainly welcome. And um, is there a link, or you're just going to post the information on your blog? Yeah, it'll be on my either on my blog. My easiest way to get to the blog is coros.ca. But the actual course, there will be updates at eci831.wikispaces.com. And when I say you can take the course, uh, I mean you can come for one day uh, if that's what you want, or you can come to the whole thing if you want. You can participate. You can do the assignments. You can do as much as you want or as little as you want. And that's kind of the neat way of doing it. Some people. You know, so a lot of people I noticed didn't ever come to the sessions, but they were there helping my students, which is to me a really cool way of participating in the course. So uh, there's been all sorts of ways that you want to, but hopefully you get some sort of experience from it. Uh, and if you want to see any of the sessions that we did, uh, all of the live sessions are recorded. I think if you click on the ECI H31 Wikispaces link that I just posted there. And if you want to see any of our live sessions, they're all recorded under weekly synchronous sessions on the right side. Okay, and we have a lot of those links posted in our GLAM link um, from your glamorous co host here. And I know last, um, or was it a year or two ago, that George Siemens and Stephen Downs got together their constructivism course. And they had over 2,000 people sign up for the course and start out the course. And of course, you know, people on the time commitment it didn't end up with 2,000. But that was still a, a great opportunity as well in the same line of thinking of open courses online. I'm not sure if you could get grad credit with them, but um, it was still a great, you know, process and project to be involved in. Yeah, and I think they actually worked out some ways of doing that. Um, you know, it, when it comes down to grad credit, you do we have anybody here who would like to uh, ask a question of Alex? Yeah, Christina is saying that credit was possible. So there's a number of ways of actually doing that, uh, where you can actually talk to your uh, your educational institution and saying, okay, well, I want to do this as an independent study, for instance, and I'll take the content of the course, participate in it, but you do the assessment differently. So that's one uh, kind of easy way to do that, uh, depending on your institution, rather than taking it as an actual course from an institution. But I know uh, talking to George and Stephen, they had uh, a number of different ways that they were able to do that. Uh, in, in, and, and the same thing goes with my course as well. I know uh, several people wanted to do it for credit. Um, but whether we do the assessment or whether your institution does the assessment, that's really up to you and your program. Great, great suggestion to contact, um, of course, your university that you're affiliated with. And I'm going to go ahead and close out, formally close out the session, but we hope that you will stay on and ask questions of Alec. Um, and we'll be using the mic or the chat. We want to let everybody know that next Saturday uh, there will not be a show um, in observance of Christmas, but the next show will be on January the 2nd, 2010. And it's going to be an anniversary show, a year in review. It will be a year that we started the show. And our special guests will be you, our participants, and any of the guests that we've had on our show throughout the year. So we hope that you'll make time to uh, attend that session and invite others and your colleagues to join us as well as we kind of do a year in review and talk about some of the topics that came up. And as soon as you exit the session, there will be a survey that pops up. If you could please fill that out. And also if you'd like a professional development certificate, Peggy did a fantastic job of creating the certificate and sending those out. Um, so if you'll just indicate your name and your email address, we will send you the certificate that you can uh, turn in for hours if your school or district accepts that. And we'd like to extend a very special thanks to Alec today for joining us and Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0 and several other networking communities. Thank you so much to each of you who have participated today and shared links and ideas in the session. 
and we greatly are appreciative of Illuminate and Learn Central for providing this forum for us to meet and connect with each and every week. And so now I'm uh, going to pass it back to Alec. And if you have a question that you would like to ask of Alec, if you'll please click on the hand with the green up arrow, and then we can give you the microphone. If not, you can just type your question in the chat, and we will address some of those questions. And one of the questions I saw earlier was, how does your university feel, Alec, about you offering the open online courses? Yeah, that's a good question. They've actually been very supportive of my work, and that's one reason I really like the University of Regina. Um, we're small enough that we allow our professors to do things that are innovative. We're not bound by any particular protocols of, say, a really large research university, and I think that's been very good. So these things uh, count for everything. They count for um, my tenure and promotion. They count for my teaching. They count for research, and I think it's been very good that way. So my, my institution has, has been very supportive of that. I'm not sure if you'll find that at every institution, um, uh, but I think the more that we do push this idea, the more you will see it. Certainly, the whole idea of open content uh, and sharing resources, open courseware, is something that has been won, I think, by a lot of institutions, by the big ones like MIT doing this. And the more you see uh, these big institutions push out these things um, to other, you know, push out lectures and so on, I think this is going to be much more easier, or much easier to sort of take because I think institutions that don't do this are going to be lost. I really do think so. Um, so that's a good question. I also saw a couple of other questions um, earlier. Let's see if I can go back. Um, I think Meredith says, can you talk more about the professional, personal professional overlap? And is it different for teachers as opposed to university profs? And, and I think that you know that's fair. I think that it would be di more difficult for a K to 12 teacher to be as open as perhaps some of the you know as as open in some ways, uh, especially depending on how you interact with your students online. Um, but really, if I look at it, I am a K-12 teacher. I mean, experienced. I've been in K-12 environment for a long time. That moved to university, and I don't see any of the things that I do online that would have been any different, or I don't think I would have been critiqued as much for them, depending on where I worked. But in the places I worked, I would have been fine doing these things. Of course, the only one thing you have to worry about more is the idea of student confidentiality. If those students have accounts on Twitter or whatever else, you've, you've got to make some choices around those. So I think that's a really good uh, question, Meredith. Um, yeah, there, there are, there, it's not a perfect uh, transition, you know, not a perfect overlap, but I think uh, you know there are certain some uh, a lot of commonalities, and I think Jerry also asked about um, what about outsiders, the idea of outsiders. Um, you know, at first, uh, my students didn't really like the outsiders. I think, or a couple of them had some issues with outsiders being in the course. But now, by the end of the course, looking at the course reflections and the evaluations, uh, they, they see the value. They understand that this was important, uh, and I think that's really important for them to understand that there's much more to education um, than just being isolated within your communities, isolated within your schools and your districts, and you understand that you can actually meet uh, and make meaningful uh, connections uh, outside of your school. And so you see that in Twitter all the time, without, with or without an open educational course. Uh, Anne asked if you have negative feedback. Um, not a whole lot. I've been actually, I don't know if I can remember any. <laughs> um, I mean, there's sometimes there's some dis discomfort level among students, um, but usually it ha it only lasts a couple or two, three weeks. Um, I give all of my students a very clear option at the beginning that we explain um, what this course is about, what types of things you'll be doing that you'll have to kind of get out of your comfort zone in terms of privacy. Um, and really, once they do that, like I, I say, because you have the first couple of weeks to actually switch to another class if you want to do something different. Um, and I, I think I had one student uh, switch to another class the first year we took it before we've ever done any of this. Um, and I think she was just uncomfortable. And she had happened to be in a situation where she had to be very private about her personal 
life. Uh, and I think it might have been to do with some personal problems she had been going through. But since then, there's never been anyone quit or, um, you know, there's been some discomfort at first, but nothing that hasn't been overcome. And I think that's important that people, you know, like you said, step out of their comfort zone because I think there will be a larger move towards this, especially if they ever get that um, world university going. That would be totally free too. Uh, another question that I saw um, from Matt was, is this model scalable to larger institutions and to the average university instructor? Uh, I, I think, Matt, I think that's uh, a really good question and I've been asked that a lot and I still don't have a good, good answer for that. Um, I think it's going to come down to people who really want to do this. I don't think this can be mandated um, by your university. I don't think this is right for every professor. Um, and part of it I think goes with my argument at the beginning that you have to learn how, you, I think there are certain things, you, you have to be open yourself to be able to do this because if you don't believe in it, it's not going to work for you. If you haven't built a personal learning network, it's not going to work for you. And so I think it's important to understand um, that this may not be for everyone. I don't think it should be mandated, but mandated by universities, but I think a university would be, um, would be smart to take a group of people who can do this and create a program out of that to actually get people that can do it this way, this way create the program based on that. Um, so that means hiring practices that, okay, so we're thinking about putting together this program. What do you think about being online? What do you think about sharing online and so on? And I think that's really, really important. Um, but I don't think it should be mandated because I think certainly a lot of people who are teaching right now just couldn't do it because they don't believe it. It's, it's not a skill set. This is a mindset. And if your mindset is not there, you will never get the skill set. Um, how, how do your colleagues um, perceive or, or see your courses? Is there uh, uh, something yeah, in the chat like uh, jealousy and? Yeah, I, th I think there may be a bit of that because obviously, um, at my stage in career, I probably have uh, a, a bit more of a profile, I guess, than than others who are at the same uh, same career stage. Um, so I do get more attention in the press and so on, and and, and that you know those sort of things happen. Um, I, I don't know if it's jealousy, but it certainly it, it puts you at a different uh, in a different space than a lot of other colleagues, I think. Um, but generally, the people that I that I talk to um, online, like, and, and I think that's the same with a lot of other disciplines. That if you're a philosophy, you know, a, a philosophy person or a history person in, in an institution, there's a good chance that you have allegiances to people perhaps not in your university as much as people in different universities or in the same discipline. And I think that happens a lot here. But I'm able to engage a lot more and a lot more often with people in ed tech and social media. I think that's kind of a neat thing to actually uh, to be able to do. So I, I think it's, it's difficult to understand when you're not in this. And maybe it's jealousy, maybe it's misunderstanding. Um, but certainly there is a different space that you are in, I think. Um, and I think, uh, you know, being on the leading edge, you, you do perhaps get different types of criticism uh, in some ways, um, but it's nothing that I can't, um, uh, I can't sort of, basically, you know, these are the things I'm doing. They are as valuable as, you know, these papers that 10 people read, for instance. Um, so the, the idea of influence has been problematic in some ways. So if I look at, uh, you know, if I look at even my tenure and profile, you know, I'll, I'll bring that up again. So if I, if I look at my uh, tenure and promotion application that I just put in, and hopefully I'll get this, um, you know, because I'm fairly early in my career, and, but, you know, I've got a lot of experience in other institutions, just not at this university. I've been here about 10 years, but as a seconded teacher for a long, long time. So I am a teacher first before anything. So, you know, but I still do my publications, I still do my research, I, I still get my grants and so on. Um, and I do that probably as much as anyone else, but then you get a lot of other presentations and keynotes and a lot of those things because I think a lot of this stuff is very new and I think that's the most important piece. And even being, uh, you know, my colleagues wouldn't normally do something like this because they, you know, they would not be known enough to uh, do something like this. And I'm not trying to toot my horn here, but I think this is just, it, it's another way of connecting. Like the, the 80 people that were here, think about if they tell one person in their institution that they saw this presentation, 
I mean, how big does that get very quickly? And that's very different than what we do normally in face-to-face -face environments at face-to-face -face conferences. Um, in some ways, you know, academic conferences can be fairly dry, and you may get, you know, 15, 20 people at a, as a at a typical academic higher ed type conference, and sometimes those ideas die in those sessions, and they never go anywhere else. Whereas I find a lot of uh, you know, a lot of fire and passion in some of these types of sessions. So it's it's a bit different again. I just I find this interesting because I'm I would have thought that your university might um, frown upon this or maybe discourage because they might feel like they're losing money and uh, people would take the open course versus a paid course. Um, so the one thing that's happening in those courses is typically uh, a full course at my university is 14. Um, I take 20 uh, and it fills up every year. So I actually add six more paying students just because I think, well, if it's 14, it's 20. If I'm if all I'm doing is connecting and not, uh, you know, in different ways and getting people to help these people in some ways, it works okay. So actually, I bring in more paid students every year. It's always full. Uh, it always has an overload. Um, you know, in every single year, and I'm getting uh, I'm getting paying students from different institutions, which is something we don't typically get very often in these other courses. So uh, the whole idea of something being free actually provides more value, and I think my institution is slowly seeing that um, that I'm not taking away value. I'm actually bringing in more students, and I'm bringing in a good reputation for my university. So I think that's something that. Uh, although it seems like you're giving something away, you're actually getting it. So there's a value in being free. Um, you know, so the, you know it's it's interesting because I mean, free is just uh, if you read any of the Stallman stuff, for instance. And I think that's a really uh, important question, Kim. But because free is not just giving away, but it's actually um, see, I'll, I'll rephrase this. Uh, what I think one of the biggest things that we really need to uh, understand is that this is the attention economy, and that when we have so much content and we have so many tools and so on, the thing that we are missing the most is attention to something. And by giving something away, you actually provide more attention or focus on that thing that you're giving away. In a sense, then it increases in value. And so the one thing that we don't have enough of onto any project, whether it's a wiki or whatever else, is the amount of attention that we put upon that. Again, so when you give away something that's free, it seems free, but you actually get more value from it, from those p people participating and from that, per from that institution that may be hosting it. So I think, I guess, that's one place I want to look at. If you want to learn more about that, um, read anything around the attention economy. I think there's a really good one um, from Goldhaber, I think. Uh, Gold, I'm going to Google it, see if I can find it. Uh, here we go. Yeah, read Michael Goldhaber, G A G O L D H A B E R, uh, around the gold, uh, around the attention economy. There's a lot of good stuff around that, and that's really, I think, one of the key uh, facets around this new sort of way of looking at things because we have so much stuff that we have out there that's free that this is much more important. I just think that's fantastic that the university was, you know willing to uh, you know take that risk. Well, and you know what? At the beginning, it wasn't a risk. I was just doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was kind of doing it under the radar. And then once it kind of got big, I couldn't do it over under the radar anymore. But they realized it was already good. And so I think at the beginning, you just do things that you're passionate about. And you don't worry about what the institution does. And, I, and, I, and I've never had in my life, not once, job security. And that's actually been a very good thing for me in some ways. I've, n I've never had tenure. I mean, this is the first time in my career since I've been you know, 21 as a teacher that I've actually had uh, job security. But I know if you keep on doing things that you're passionate about and you follow that, you will, you will always, always be ahead. And you will find some other, you know, you know I do this, uh, that curriculum document. Uh, you know, so if my institution decided to can me for whatever reason, which they certainly could, Maybe that's enough, or maybe the things I've done 
is is going to attract the attention of some recruiter out there that you know maybe will want to hire me or or you know there'll be enough value in the things that I do that that I'll be able to find a position to you know support my family and so on. But I think it's important that you you do lead with your passion and and know that you're doing the things right and then ask for that forgiveness later. I guess that's the whole point. Yeah, I I totally agree. I kind of have lived my whole life that way, asking forgiveness later. Um, one person, Emory asked, how do you see Open Ed changing the future of physical universities? Well, you know, I think um, the, the one question that we'll ask more often is what is the value of being face-to-face? -face? And that is something that we've done uh, uh, in, in our open uh, online courses, the one that Dean Shiresky teaches with us. For instance, Dean usually does the format that he meets with his students once a month in the four month period. So he meets four times and the other three times per month that they, they meet weekly um, is online. And so the, the question comes out really explicitly is what is the value of being face to face? And that happens in a course. But I think as an institution we also have to add that, ask that question as well. So what is the value of being face to face and what is you know where do we face do face to face and does it have to be in the institution or or in the place of the institution can we create cohorts uh geographically that we go to so an institution provides a program but you get enough people in this particular region and you get enough people in this particular region that meet face to face when they have to but th but I think that's the key question is what is the value of being face to face when do you do it where do you do it um and so I think the implications for for universities we're going to see a lot uh, we're, we're going to continue to see the residential universities because there is something that comes uh, that that is very valuable be it about being in a residential university. But for those people who don't need to move, that have other ways of wanting to learn, that they have careers but they want to learn, or, or they want to do things differently throughout their career, you know, and maybe not take a, a whole program at once. I think there's going to be more value for those people in the future and more options. I think uh, Tammy has a question. Or do you? I don't know. <laughs> Tammy, is your uh, your number on? There you go. I, I think two moderators tried to give me the mic. I, I it was I think given and taken very quickly. <laughs> um, I thought that I would mention some things that could help those that are in the K to 12 kind of see how this might apply to the the lower grade levels. Um, what we're doing is has a lot of similarities to what you're talking about and I've, I've really resonated with a lot of what you say. Um, with our group what we have are students that log in from all over the United States and Canada and we even have some from South America and they're logging in and getting K-12 courses for free and it's all volunteer run but some of the same things that you're talking about for instance when you were talking about the social so they could take it beyond the courses we have a whole group Ning site that serves as our social tool. So I have students that that took my biology class three years ago and they're still very active at our social Ning. They're off to college now and they still post almost every day to the students I have now in biology and it's really fun to get a chance to see them talking to, oh I remember when we did such and such, I loved and it really helps to keep motivation up and it helps them to feel like they're still a part of it which is a lot of fun and when you were talking about local cohorts um, a lot of what we've done, for instance, teaching biology online where you're not meeting in a physical environment face to face has some difficulties when it comes to labs. So we've had a lot of local groups so that the, the kids could get together in their local area. We had a local group in Pennsylvania and Illinois and Alabama and Mississippi, uh, several places where the students were close enough together and they would get together to do their labs so that they can share their expenses for microscopes, for just some of the gear that something that's individual family by family is kind of difficult to do. And plus they had the fun of getting to be able to see each other face to face periodically. Um, and I think the tools are very important too. Uh, there are a lot of courses that I've seen my son take at a college level that was just asynchronous and it was very difficult to connect. With what we're doing with the K-12 group is we've mixed asynchronous with synchronous tools. We use Illuminate and we use Moodle. And I think it really is important for K-12 to have the combination if they're not meeting face to face. 
that they also that they have a synchronous place that they can go to. Um, in my courses, I try to make it flexible. Families can choose just synchronous, though, if they want to. If they can't meet at the time that we're having our synchronous class, they can still take the class but do asynchronous. Um, I also try to give them as much flexibility as I can. The biology class that I run, the kids can actually choose whether they want to come in at the 8 a.m. session or the 2.30 session. So if we've got somebody who stayed up late last night and they're going to be too sleepy, they could sleep in and catch the 1 at 1. And those students that want to be finished up with their schoolwork by 1, they'll come in at 8. So just a lot of different things that technology now lets us do, giving our students a lot more flexibility while still providing a lot of support. But you've got to be creative. You've got to think, OK, how can we get these labs? And, and you know, it works. You, you have to puzzle over it for a little bit. But it's really exciting what technology is opening up in education. Uh, that's really great, Tammy. Tammy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go, Go ahead, Alex. Thanks. I just wanted to say that you know those are really great stories because um, you know my disadvantage is I'm not in K to 12 anymore, but I want to be able to share those pieces with others. So I think your your stories here really you know demonstrate that there are so many different good options out there. The idea of alumni continuing to come back that these spaces kind of take over themselves and sometimes in some cases um, you know in un unexpected ways. And I really do think that. We must have for K-12 students or whatever. You know, we must have these consistent community spaces that we don't continue to take them down all the time, because um, they will do their, you know, their talking on Facebook and that sort of thing. But if you do create a consistent community space uh, and you continue to nurture it and you get those, uh, you know, those active voices, you can end up with a really good, vibrant community. And I think that's what what it sounds like you have in your case. So thanks for sharing those stories because I think we need this. We need to share uh, the K-12 story. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And those types of connections that you're talking about. And Tammy does phenomenal work with students. And her virtual homeschool network is all in Illuminate. And she just does phenomenal work in making things interactive um, for her students. She's just fantastic. Um, I also saw a question is, how do you use peer assessment, Alex? Um, that's actually one thing I did uh, the second time around the course, uh, not the first or the third, um, and it worked pretty well. But we just kind of it just kind of dropped off after that. Um, but it's something that I want to kind of bring back in because I think it's probably one of the most imp important pieces that I'm missing is uh, a better use of peer assessment. And I just haven't got my head around on how to do it well uh, yet. Um, it's it, 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 it the second time I ran it, it felt. It didn't feel natural enough, and students felt it to be a bit of a burden, and I don't know why. Uh, and it's something that I do need to work on, and I need to look at it better because I think it's probably going to be one of the the more liberating ways of doing assessment uh, in the future. So I haven't I haven't done it well, but it's something that I do want to focus on uh, the next time around. And I think I just need to talk to someone who does this very well. Because as a teacher, I'm always learning. I'm not doing everything perfect. I'm doing things uh, in ways that I'm learning constantly, and I'm trying to reassess the tools and the assessment methods and the pedagogy I, I use. Um, so some of, the, some of the important things that we do in our best teaching in the classroom is relevant to things that we do here as well. So eventually, I, I think I want to fix that piece up a little bit. The assessment's been fine, but I do want to bring, into that, bring in that peer voice. Well, Tammy is a great resource, even though she's K-12. I know that you could take that um, adapted for your open courses. But I definitely encourage you to connect with her. She's just fantastic at what she does with Moodle and uh, Illuminate. Are there any other questions for Alec before we let him go? If so, uh, if you'd like to use your mic, you can click on the hand with the green arrow. And if not, you can um, post it here in the chat. And Tammy, if you could put in your Twitter name, that would be great, Tammy. Okay, it looks like um, we're, we may have run out of questions, so we're going to go ahead and let Alan go. But we thank everybody so much for 
uh, joining us today. And Alec and everybody, you can check out Tammy Moore. She's a very active uh, member of the Learn Central community at learncentral.org. And um, she does some great whiteboard uh, sessions there. And oh, that's the wrong link. I was trying to get the glam link. Let me get the glam link for us. And we have lots of uh, resources that Alec has shared and mentioned throughout the session. They're in the GLAM link. So you'll want to check that out as well. And remember to complete the survey link uh, when the, the window pops open after you exit. So thank you so much again, Alec, and to everybody for joining us today. And we hope you have the best of holidays and you get time to relax, refresh, and recharge and uh, start the new year out. And be sure to join us on January 2nd um, when we kick off the new year with a year in review of 2009. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, and look for the recordings to be posted to our site later this afternoon or this weekend. And take care, everybody. Have a great Saturday.